As we move into the holiday season, I think it's time we return to an old topic, something that used to be evergreen, the Pokemon formula. Did the games really need to change with Sword and Shield for competitive balance and to open up design space, or will that argument topple like a fresh cut Christmas tree? Grab something warm to drink and settle in, let's talk about it today on Draw 5 Move 5. Hey everyone, and welcome to the table. My name is Gabe, and this is Draw 5, Move 5, a show where we draw connections between the mechanics behind our favorite games. Up until a few months ago, Pokemon followed a set formula every generation. Introduce new Pokemon, bring back some old ones, and eventually allow the player to catch or import them all. However, with the ushering in of the 8th generation, and the introduction of Pokemon Sword and Shield to the series catalog, this has forever changed. We learned over the summer that the games would not feature a way to have every Pokemon in the series' massive roster available. And now, a month after the games' release, we know this isn't going to change. There's a lot of controversy surrounding these games, but that's not the focus of today's discussion. If you want to hear more about my initial thoughts and about Evergreen game series in general, check out our previous discussion on the subject. I also want to be totally transparent with you. As much as I love Pokemon, I do not own a Switch and was not about to buy one for Sword and Shield. All the impressions and information I have is based on research and asking a variety of friends for their honest opinions after having played the game. Some of them are casual fans, other diehards, and I can say that I was pleasantly surprised with their reactions. There are definitely some issues with textures, modeling, and what feels like, to some extent, a lack of ambition with pushing the games to be more especially considering that these are the first mainline games in the series to be on a home console. If there was ever a time to go big or go home, this was it. However, the games are still fun. They're still Pokemon. Other than a minor sense of disappointment at a slight lack of quality and content, everyone I know playing the games is enjoying them. And some of the weirder aspects, like the Pokemon popping in and out of the overworld, have almost become amusing in their own way. Because of this, I don't think it's really worth talking about the visual quality of the games. That topic isn't as much about game design as it is visual design and appeal, which, although important, aren't really the focus of this channel. What I do want to focus on is the other reason for the cuts and changes. In an interview with US Gamer, Junichi Masuda, the game's director, stated that a large part of the decision to cut over half the series' roster was for the balance of the competitive and casual environment. Pokemon, like many other evergreen games, such as Yu-Gi-Oh!, allowed the use of any and all of its creations from its entire design history. Charizard and Clefable could still see competitive play in Sun and Moon, 20 years after the release of the original games. Many of these older Pokemon received a move, ability, or type updates, and even new forms to allow them to compete in the evolving competitive landscape and be viable choices for a casual playthrough. However, with a roster as large as Pokemon's, some creatures were bound to be better, and others much, much worse. Additionally, we've seen a lot of overlapping ideas from generation to generation for Pokemon designs, again because the roster is so huge. We have multiple bug, bird, and fish Pokemon, and while many are based on different creatures and have unique designs or ideas, they're all still the regional bug, or bird, or fish, and often these Pokemon can fall into obscurity. From a game design perspective, why is this? While every Pokemon has a variety of factors that can determine its success, often the largest ones are its base stat total and typing. The base stat total is the grand total of all the Pokemon's minimum base stats, not including factors specific to individual members of the species and how they were raised. Typing, meanwhile, gives the Pokemon resistances and weaknesses to other Pokemon and their moves, in addition to boosting any move that shares a type with the Pokemon's. To see how this works, let's take a look at one of the oldest Pokemon in the series, and one that was cut from Sword and Shield, Beedrill. Beedrill has always been, quite frankly, an awful Pokemon in a competitive sense, and not just in video game tournaments. In Generation 1, the Pokemon was weak to Psychic, the strongest type in the game, and incredibly frail to begin with. Its stat total adds up to a measly 395 as a fully evolved three-stage line. Compared to the starter Pokemon's final evolutions, such as Charizard with a base total of 534, Beedrill can't even hold a candle to them. 
Combined with poor typing and few good move options, Beedrill lay in obscurity until it received Mega Evolution in Generation 6. With a new ability that made its poison and bug moves twice as deadly, and a 100 point boost to its base stat line along with a stat redistribution, Mega Beedrill was suddenly seeing experimentation when normal Beedrill had never been effective. Part of the reason for this change is because although Mega Beedrill still had a lower base stat total than other Mega Evolutions, and even some other Pokemon, it utilized the design principle of min-maxing. Min-maxing is the idea of taking the best stats a character has and focusing on those while decreasing or ignoring their poor stats to make them highly effective at one thing or in one situation. Outside of Pokemon, we can see it has uses in games with skill trees like Spider-Man and the Batman Arkham series, and any series with stat allocation like Dungeons and & Dragons and Betrayal at the House on the Hill. In our Pokemon example, Beedrill has three high stats. Its attack and speed, which reflect its aggressive and quick nature as a bee, that's good design by the way folks, as well as a special defense stat that's slightly higher than its speed. Based on its other stats however, Beedrill was incredibly frail, with very low defense and not much better health. This meant that even though its special defense wasn't horrible, it didn't have enough health to take hits from super effective moves or even powerful moves that hit it neutrally, especially if those moves were physical instead of special. When designing a Mega Evolution for Beedrill, rather than use the stat bonus available to increase its defenses or its special attack stat, Game Freak doubled down on what made Beedrill Beedrill. Its attack and speed received major buffs, going from 90 and 75 to 150 and 145 respectively, along with an ability that focused on offense. Additionally, Game Freak actually decreased Mega Beedrill's special attack stat by 30 points, so they could allocate it to other more useful stats, as no one would ever try to play a special attack focused Beedrill because it would be so much worse than the alternative that it wasn't worth it. Even though it didn't have a high stat total, by min-maxing, Mega Beedrill was able to compete with other more powerful Pokemon. It carved out a small spot in the realm of powerful, fast, and frail attackers, otherwise known as Glass Cannons, like Gengar and Alakazam, both of whom are from the first generation, and received Mega Evolutions as well that added new depth to their gameplay options. You'll notice, however, that two of the Pokemon I just mentioned, Beedrill and Alakazam, are not in Sword and Shield. Mega Evolutions were removed this generation, and without them, Beedrill wouldn't have stood a chance to begin with. In fact, no new fully evolved Pokemon introduced in Sword and Shield have a base stat total below 440, and only 6 are available from every generation that have a stat line less than 400, two of which, Ditto and Wishy Washy, have alternative forms that allow them to have much higher stat totals. This, I imagine, was part of the calling of Pokemon to create a more balanced metagame. The idea that Masuda spoke of. So too was the removal of Pokemon like Alakazam, which have been at the competitive forefront since their inception. Alakazam has been a viable threat in every generation since it's existed, being at least playable in competitive and gaining new tools over the generations, such as the hidden ability Magic Guard in Generation 5, which grants it protection from all indirect damage sources, and its Mega Evolution in Generation 6, as well as new moves available every generation. Alakazam may have been removed to try and open space for other fast special attackers to shine, or more likely, other psychic types. We can notice that Gengar remains, along with most of the previous ghost types in the game's history, because there are far fewer of them than there are bug and psychic types. Culling the herd is less necessary for ghosts than it is for the bug or psychic types. Taking in all of this information, we can see a general trend. Pokemon are being removed to bring them closer to a certain average stat range, between 400 and 600, while the amount of Pokemon of each type are reaching a balance unlike in previous generations, with an average around 40 Pokemon per type available in-game at the time of recording. This is what Masuda was talking about by balancing the game, and to a large degree I think it may be accomplished that goal, at least in theory. See, a funny thing happens when you take out the best options available. The ones just below them on the ladder climb to the highest rung. The information in this section was gathered from Samurai Gamer's first double battle tier list, assembled based on the current trends in competitive online play over the past month. Links in the description below if you want to check out the whole list. To sum up, however, Pokemon like Excadrill, Whimsicott, and Gastrodon, which have seen their share of competitive play and experimentation in the past, are back on top of the pile because they weren't cut from the game. 
Sword and Shield introduced new and updated mechanics, like stat changes to team speed immediately coming into effect, and max moves that have side effects to set up weather and buff your entire team. We can see that all of these changes benefit Pokemon already in use in previous generations, like Excadrill now being able to set up its own Sandstorm while attacking. Of the Pokemon breaching the top tiers, only about a quarter of them are actually new Pokemon introduced in Sword and Shield, with the same several, Corviknight, Dragapult, Duraludon, and Dragovish, seeing the most experimentation. Sword and Shield still have a metagame developing, but it's primarily composed of old dogs with new tricks. The same as it's been every generation for the past 20 years, even without cutting the Pokedex down. The question to ask then, is if it was necessary to break the Evergreen formula for the sake of balance, and was it necessary to cut Mega Evolutions, which created new design space? If we're looking strictly at balance, then from a technical perspective, yes, the cuts were necessary. Game Freak has hard reset the power cap in the series with this generation. No Pokemon that is legal and competitive at the time of recording has a base stat total higher than 600, or lower than 400 with a few very specific exceptions. And by this metric, I can understand why Mega Evolutions were removed. A variety of Mega Evolutions, such as both of Charizard's Mega Forms, Mega Gyarados, and Mega Lucario, which would have to have been in this game based on the Pokédex, all have a base stat total over 600. Combine this with Dynamax, and even though the opportunity for more Mega Evolutions is appealing, especially because of the increased design space it makes available, I can understand why, in the interest of balance, these options were removed. If we look at it from a practical and design-oriented perspective, however, I'm not sure we can reach that same conclusion. While it's true that the number of Pokemon has been significantly decreased, many of the Pokemon kept around from previous generations are still taking up the top slots in competitive, and the majority of them, new and old, have a base stat total over 500. Those that don't have a specific gimmick or role they fill that allows for experimentation. Additionally, many of the Pokemon that have come to the forefront were as a result of Dynamaxing and the new mechanical changes that come with it. Excadrill, Braviary, and Arcanine are all Pokemon that benefit heavily from the additional buffs they can provide for themselves and their teams due to the side effects of max moves. It's not the Pokemon going away that made these creatures viable, it's the new mechanics that created this scenario. New mechanics that don't play nicely with Mega Evolution, and perhaps may be a detriment to design space in the future. Creating a phenomena that can be used once per battle with any Pokemon without the need for a held item or any other special restrictions forces Game Freak to design Pokemon in that 400 to 600 base stat range and never be able to introduce new features that break that range like Mega Evolution ever again, despite it being an arguably more exciting design space due to new evolutions being available for old Pokemon. Dynamaxing only feels safe because of the restricted environment Game Freak created, and quite frankly, it feels like they may have chosen to restrict the Pokemon available in order for this mechanic to function at all. If the new gimmick mechanic is what's fueling each generation's design from now on, I don't like what that means for the future of Pokemon. I don't think Game Freak can or will correct course at this point and return to the Evergreen formula they've run with for years. To do so now would be to admit that they made the mistake and allowed themselves to be so enthralled with a new mechanic they felt the need to remove previous designs from the game just to make it work. Were there some balance issues in the series? Of course, but what series doesn't have problems with balance? Pokemon sits in a unique position of not updating its games after release to fix balance issues, largely because they didn't used to be able to. And as a result, they've committed to every design they ever made. Other than light tweaking from generation to generation, the only way for them to fix some of these issues was to remove them from the player's hands which feels like it wasn't the right solution, especially considering the precedent it sets. Does this mean in Generation 9 we'll get another new mechanic, and Dynamaxing will go out the window in favor of it? How many old Pokemon will be cut then? Surely they don't plan on cutting Pikachu, or Eevee, or Charizard anytime soon, which means there are at least 15 Pokemon we're guaranteed to have every generation when you include their evolution families, and 15 deserving Pokemon that have to be removed despite a beloved status amongst fans. I really hope Game Freak can see that the Evergreen system wasn't the problem, and return to letting us catch them all, is the series' motto after all, rather than making flashy new mechanics to shift the design space in an interesting, but limited, direction. 
Thank you so much for watching. You have my humble and eternal gratitude. What did you think of the conversation? Do you think from a practical, balancing perspective, the changes Game Freak made were necessary? And what are your thoughts on Sword and Shield overall? I love to hear your thoughts, so let's keep this discussion rolling down in the comments. If you enjoyed the conversation and you want to hear more from me, subscribe and dingling that notification bell so you never miss an update. Things have been a bit hectic around here with the end of the semester, but now that we're getting into the holiday season, I have the opportunity to reorganize, rest, and get back to putting out videos every other week on games and gaming mechanics. And dropping a like lets me know you want to see more. Follow the channel on Twitter and Facebook at Draw5Move5. It's the best way to stay involved on any important announcements and get hyped for new videos. My name is Gabe. This is Draw5Move5. Until next time, go have a good game.